Hey, it's Lou, and here's the thing. Technology has its eyes on you, but it's one thing to be seen. It's something entirely different to be identified. I'm talking about facial recognition technology, which I'll call FRT. It can locate a face in an image, compare it to a database, and report all types of personal information. Oh look, that random guy is acting strange can become, oh look, that guy is acting strange, and here's his name, home address, and arrest record. FRT is already deployed in countries across the world, including the US and China, but it's hard to tell exactly where else because the industry lacks oversight. In the US, it's primarily used on previously recorded footage. However, the ability to track and identify people in real time does exist. Either way, this is an extremely powerful tool and there's sharp disagreement about whether it's too powerful, if anyone could be trusted with it. On the one hand, proponents like law enforcement agencies say it helps find criminals, potentially thwart terrorist attacks, and locate missing people and pets. On the other hand, skeptics like civil rights groups think facial recognition used by governments could threaten due process, can exacerbate racial discrimination, and might lead to weaponized abusive surveillance. But this isn't solely a law enforcement matter. There are commercial and medical implications for FRT. And connecting all of this is the privacy component. When we know an omniscient eye is keeping tabs on us, will we act freely? You might already use facial recognition technology to unlock your iPhone or automatically tag a friend on Facebook, but FRT extends beyond mere convenience. In New Delhi, India, it was used to identify nearly 3,000 missing children in just four days. Photos taken in orphanages were compared to a lost child database. This is tedious work for flesh and blood investigators, and it's complicated by the fact that children look different as they age, but the artificial intelligence behind FRT was able to overcome those challenges. The tech has also been used to prevent and solve crimes. In the wake of the Capitol Gazette murders in Maryland, for example, the local police department used FRT to identify the alleged perpetrator. And some airports are deploying FRT to spot imposters using someone else's passport. Furthermore, Professor Marios Savides, director of the Scilab Biometric Center at Carnegie Mellon University, told me the technology can be used to help identify victims in a natural disaster. He also highlighted potential uses in medicine, like diagnosing skin cancer or identifying the symptoms of autism. All of this sounds awesome, but Evan Selinger, a philosopher of technology at the Rochester Institute of Technology, told me we can get distracted by all those accomplishments and fail to consider the dark side of FRT. In a paper, he and a colleague described FRT as a menace disguised as a gift and an irresistible tool for oppression. Salinger envisions a situation where the government can arbitrarily track you and learn about your habits, relationships, and interests. He worries it can be used to facilitate harassment. That is, the police can basically stalk suspects or harass innocent citizens. He added that the tech is very easy to abuse because there's no federal U.S. laws governing its use. Several municipalities are currently contemplating legislation. A city supervisor in San Francisco is seeking to ban the local government from using FRT, for example. But in the interim, Salinger says it's pretty much the Wild West. Consider, in 2016, the U.S. Government Accountability Office evaluated the FBI's use of FRT and found it should ensure better privacy and accuracy. One of the big questions is when the FBI has a photo of a potential suspect, what database do they compare it to? And what's in that database? Where are the pictures from? The FBI did not respond to these questions when I posed them, but that 2016 GAO report found that 16 states have given the FBI access to DMV photos. Selinger told me it's easy to imagine the database expanding eventually to include pictures from social media. I asked the New York City Police Department, which has had a facial recognition unit since 2011, what rules govern their use of FRT and what's in their database. They responded, quote, the NYPD has moved deliberately and responsibly in the use of facial recognition software. There is no NYPD case where an arrest or prosecution was brought on the basis of facial recognition. The NYPD uses it on a case-by-case -case basis, and the case must always be supported by further investigation before any arrest is made. The NYPD has absolutely no interest in wholesale surveillance, which would be an enormous and entirely pointless 
task. Savides, who has worked with the NYPD, stressed that facial recognition is only used as a compass, a way to generate leads and point investigators in the right direction. He told me there's a misconception that facial recognition is replacing police work and legal proceedings. He insists it's merely part of the process. I asked him what he makes of all the dystopian visions of mass surveillance. He told me that's the byproduct of Hollywood brainwashing the population through franchises like Jason Bourne and Mission Impossible into thinking that the tech has all these capabilities it doesn't actually have and that these capabilities are employed nefariously. Fair enough. However, FRT has been deployed in a rather Orwellian fashion in China, where there's already an estimated 200 million surveillance cameras and almost 100 million more expected by 2020. Last month, Dutch security researcher Victor Gevers told ZDNet that Chinese police are using FRT to track the GPS coordinates of Uyghur Muslims in the Xinjiang region. This is a minority group that has faced intense repression. According to some estimates, over a million Uyghurs are held in political re-education camps. Of course, China is an authoritarian state where dissent is not tolerated. In the US, conversely, civil rights groups like the ACLU and the EFF have fought to limit this type of intrusive surveillance. Real-time FRT is a subject of particularly intense debate. Last year, the Orlando Police Department experimented with Amazon's real-time FRT, which drew criticism. There's a fear that real-time FRT will eventually wind up in police body cams, transforming officers into high-tech surveillance machines. And when an officer knows that the guy in front of him had previously been arrested on a weapons charge, critics worry that might make the officer a little jumpy. Within the FRT industry itself, some leaders have begun grappling with all these implications. In a December 2018 blog post, Microsoft's president called for FRT regulation, and in a June 2018 article for TechCrunch, Brian Brackeen, the founder of Miami-based FRT company, explains why he would never sell his company's tech to law enforcement, writing, quote, there is no place in America for facial recognition that supports false arrests and murder. But laws and good intentions aside, there's also serious questions about the accuracy of facial recognition technology. For instance, using Amazon's facial recognition software, the ACLU conducted a test in 2018 that erroneously matched 28 members of Congress with individuals in a public database of mugshots. A disproportionate number of these Congress people were people of color, 39%. This underscores a disturbing reality. FRT struggles to identify both women and people of color. One MIT computer scientist, Joy Bulamwini, demonstrated that facial recognition software couldn't identify the gender of Oprah, Michelle Obama, or Serena Williams. The system I was using worked well on my lighter skinned friend's face, but when it came to detecting my face, it didn't do so well until I put on a white mask. Bulamwini says this is the product of the coded gaze, the fact that algorithms inevitably have the same conscious and unconscious biases of the people who create and train them. And remember, the most recent government statistics published in 2014 found the tech industry was predominantly comprised of white men. Now, this AI bias is a problem in the context of facial recognition for a number of reasons. In a police context, it can lead to a false positive. That individual who is incorrectly identified as a person of interest might then have to contend with the police investigation. This is often explained away as a mere inconvenience that could be quickly rectified, but it's definitely unpleasant when the police are knocking on your door asking about a crime. Your neighbors can see that, that can change their perception of you forever. And we've seen seemingly innocuous police civilian interactions turn problematic, even deadly, quite quickly, especially when there's a racial undertone. And keep in mind, Amazon has reportedly pitched its FRT to immigration and customs enforcement. Savitas acknowledged that there are issues with FRT, but told me additional research and funding ought to iron out the kinks. He also thinks law should be passed to govern its use. Lauren Rue, a professor of information systems and analytics at Wake Forest School of Business, is worried that it's too late. She told me that she's particularly concerned with the potential commercial applications of FRT. In the future, retailers might be able to clandestinely scan your face, detect things like your gender, age, ethnicity, and even mood, and then tailor marketing messages that nudge you into certain purchasing decisions that you otherwise would not make. I'd say this is the very edge of where marketing meets exploitation. And in the absence of legislation, companies can create their own databases. A photo of your face can be stored alongside your purchasing history, for instance, and perhaps this information is sold to third parties. 
So the question becomes, can we create laws that allow FRT for things like locating missing children, but prevent it from being abused by aggressive authorities and unscrupulous retailers? Selinger doesn't think so. He has argued passionately that laws will never be able to stop abuse and unintended consequences. To quote a paper he co-authored, if you build it, they will surveil. That's why he's called for an outright ban. He's particularly worried that FRT will have a chilling effect on behavior. When we know we're being watched and we can be identified, we might think twice about our actions. All right, I countered, but why should I be worried about that if I have nothing to hide? Selinger told me that right and wrong are often subjective. Social norms in different parts of the world force members of the LGBT community to hide their relationships. That doesn't mean those relationships are wrong. And he said the I've got nothing to hide argument sort of falls apart when you consider the fact that most people close the door when they go to the bathroom or password protect their email accounts. And besides, you might want to attend a protest or a political rally without the government knowing. Selinger added that FRT can hasten the end of guilty pleasures. I know what he means. When I realized that the music I streamed was being shared with my music knob friends on Spotify, I started listening to a lot less Maroon 5. Eventually, I figured out how to have private listening sessions, but my point is, sometimes we want to obscure our private selves and our private desires from the rest of the world, and there's nothing fishy about that. Selinger told me this gets at a common confusion about privacy. We often think it's about having secrets, usually embarrassing secrets. Instead, we should think of privacy as the ability to control information about ourselves. And by choosing what we share and with who, we're able to develop intimate relationships. But if an all-knowing eye is able to track and record our movements and our behavior, if the whole world is an open book, then we're deprived of that ability to choose who to share with, who to trust. Now, to be clear, FRT doesn't have to slide down the slippery slope towards constant omniscient surveillance. As Safidis told me, it's important not to confuse the current situation with the movie Minority Report. He urged me to underscore the real world benefits, like finding missing children, and not harp on all the big brother speculation. But recent history has revealed that tech can be hacked or is often abused. See the Cambridge Analytica scandal, for instance. So perhaps we ought to slow down and carefully consider how to regulate facial recognition technology before it's irreversibly integrated into society and becomes part of our cultural norms. Transparency is essential. We ought to demand it. In the past several decades, we've allowed tech to move too fast and break too many things. It's time we learned a lesson from that experience. Okay. I'm gonna go live my life.